Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. I tell you, I have, I don't know how many times I've read through the Gospel of Matthew. This is the first time that I've ever done kind of a verse-by-verse -verse study through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, there's, there's an awful lot here. We could spend a lot longer than we are going through here. But we'll keep moving right along and try to just get kind of an idea. I, the, the title of this series I've given is Kingdom Life. Uh, because Jesus is talking about, hey, this is what it's going to be like in the kingdom. This is, this is how disciples, those who have Christ as Lord of their life, this is how they lead their lives. And Jesus has laid out... You know, the hopelessness of trusting in works or keeping the law for salvation. In verse 20, he says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Remember, that would have conveyed hopelessness to everyone in the crowd. Uh, that's, that would be the equivalent of me saying, in order to get this job, you need to be able to run a one-minute mile. You say, but, but nobody can run a one-minute mile. That's the point. Nobody is more righteous than these men who claim to be the most righteous. No one, with the exception of the one speaking in this case. As Jesus speaks of the law, he's building up, and I've given this to you. It's the last verse in chapter, 40, in chapter 5, verse 48. He says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So uh, there's the standard. It's impossible and so we, we come to accept that. We understand, of course, our only hope for perfection is not by our behavior, but by having the righteousness of Christ imputed to our account. That's the only hope you've got. Uh, what we just sang, I need no other righteousness. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. So to further make his point, Jesus is going to take several of the commandments from the law. He'll, he'll take some of the Ten Commandments, but he's going to take some other portions of the law. And he's going to explain the spirit of the law. What does it mean if I say, I keep the letter of the law, but not the spirit? What is that, what is that essentially saying? Some people see what you do. Yeah. I keep the letter of the law but not the spirit. It, it, it's the idea of somebody who's kind of looking for loopholes. Somebody who's, they get as close to the edge so that way when you come to them and you say, hey, you're, you're doing wrong, they can say, no, 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 no. Let me show you. I'm doing exactly what the law says. And you say, yeah, but you're not doing what the law means. I'm keeping the letter of the law, but not the spirit. This is what the religious leaders of Jesus' day had done with the law. They had, they had eliminated that aspect. They, they were big on keeping the letter of the law. Anything short of the actual murder of an individual, and you're good. Don't worry about it. He said, I, I, did, I didn't murder them. I, I did not actually kill that person. You say, well, you, you got awful close. Well, that doesn't matter. I, I didn't do the thing that I was told not to do. As long as you don't commit the physical act of adultery, you're fine, was how they looked at it. And so Jesus is going to take the, the letter of the law, and he's going to explain the spirit of the law. Hey, this is what it says. This is what God expects of you. Jesus is going to explain the true meaning of God's moral law. This explanation is going to show two things. Number one, it's going to show his heart. When, when you read the rules of a particular organization, you can find out their heart as it relates to their employees or to their customers. Okay? And so God's law is going to reveal God's heart. It's also going to reveal, once again, our inability to earn salvation through perfectly keeping the law. It's going to reveal to us the hopelessness once again. And we start off with a big one here in verse 21. We'll call it the path of murder. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, God has always, always placed value upon human life. Before the law of Moses, in Genesis 9, verse 6, 
God told this would be Noah. He said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. What do we call this principle right here? It has a technical name in our law system. It's called capital punishment. punishment. Yeah, the idea that you, if you kill somebody, then your life is going to be taken from you. That's, that was instituted not by man, but by God. God said that. In order, and the reason why that he gives, if you shed man's blood, then your life is forfeit because man is made in the image of God. That's what he says here in Genesis 9, 6. In Exodus 20, very famously, thou shalt not kill. It's repeated exactly in Deuteronomy 5, 17. Now, the word kill in both cases, in both testaments, it means to commit murder. It is not referring to the act of taking human life in war. Obviously, as you, as you read through the Old Testament, God commanded his, his people to take the life of the enemies of Israel. It is This commandment is not prohibiting the taking of life in war or in that of defense of self, family, or even of property. If you read through and you're, you're looking through the law, you will find many, many different instances where God says, look, if you do this, then your life is forfeit, okay, for, for these reasons. So uh, those who committed murder, however, those who we have in America, we have multiple degrees of murder. We have second, first, and third degree murder. The worst of all being first degree murder. First degree murder is premeditated. It means I sat at home, I thought about it, I planned it, I went out, I killed that person. Now, there's, I, I believe it's third degree murder would be almost like a manslaughter. You know, you, you accidentally hit someone who's going through a crosswalk walk, and you didn't, you didn't set out with malice of forethought. Okay, in this case, we're talking about the act of murder, and we'll follow up. You'll see what he's talking about as we go. The act of murder is one who committed that, we would call a murderer, and a murderer stands in danger of judgment. The Greek word is the word crisis, and it means condemnation or sentencing. Now, no one in Jesus' day, scribes, Pharisees, no one would have disagreed with what Jesus just said. Everyone says, if you kill somebody, you stand in danger of judgment. That's even pretty widely accepted today in our culture. If, if somebody says, well, they killed somebody, you'd say, well, then they, they should be judged as a result of that. But look at what Jesus says in verse 22, because here, here's where Jesus is going to, to make some people's heads explode, as it were. Look at verse 22. He says, but I say unto you. <laughs> we'll just stop right there. Okay, Look at verse 21 and look at what Jesus said. He said... Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Okay, so who are we talking about? We looked, I gave you two verses here in your handout. Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Who's talking there? It is God talking to Moses. Okay, and then in Exodus Chapter 20, who's, who's talking? Well, it's God, again, speaking to Moses. Or you could even say, it's Moses speaking. It's the law of Moses. <coughs> Jesus says, ye have heard it said of them in old time that you shouldn't do this. In verse 22, but I say unto you. The very way that Jesus phrases this claim, this statement, claims superiority to Moses and it claims equality with the Father. Because if God said this, and Moses said this, and Jesus says, but now listen to me. Do you, do you see how he's making himself equal? That would have, there was a lot of, I would imagine the people who were sitting there in, in the, at the Sermon on the Mount, probably the scribes and the Pharisees out at the fringes, their jaws fell open. Their eyes got big. They looked at one another. Did you hear what he just said? Do you hear what he just said? Jesus is able to speak with authority on this matter because if you look back at verse 17, Jesus has already said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
He's the only one whose righteousness exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees. Verse 20. Who else but God can declare what he actually meant in the law of Moses? And so for Jesus to say, this is what God said, this is what Moses said, now listen to me. That, that would be the equivalent of me standing up on Sunday saying, now, close your Bibles and listen to what I have to say. If I ever do that, you should, you should walk out. Okay, That's <laughs> unacceptable on any level for a preacher to say, now close your Bibles and listen to me. Because what is that claiming? That's claiming my opinion is, we're, we're pretty much the same. Now listen to me. No, but Jesus can. Why? Because Jesus is God. So it works when Jesus does it. It doesn't work when anybody else does it. So Jesus says, this is what they said then. Listen to me now. He says that the law says, whoever commits murder is worthy of judgment to be condemned in sentence. But Jesus speaks with authority and says that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. The law spoke of the act. Jesus speaks of the condition of the heart. The law said if you commit the act, if you actually take the knife, the club, and you kill someone, then you're in danger of judgment. Jesus says if you have hatred in your heart, you're guilty of judgment. The same thing, the same word used in verse 21 for judgment, same word used in verse 22. Here's the point. Ungodly anger is the first step towards murder. He says, whosoever is angry with his brother without cause. Now, in this case, the word anger, it's the Greek word orge. It means violent passion, vengeance, wrath. And maybe, if you're thinking, and you, you think through the Bible stories, you think, well, what about righteous anger? Because that exists. In Mark chapter 3, verse 5, you have it there on your handout. And when he, Jesus, had looked round about on them with anger, same word, or, orge, the same word, Ephesians 4, 2, be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So, what exactly is Jesus saying here? I gave you a, a, a quote here from one of the commentaries that I was going through. It says, righteous anger proceeds from love or righteousness, has in view the good of him against whom it is exercised, and looks to the glory of God. When Jesus got angry, why was he angry? Was he angry because the, because the, the scribes and the Pharisees called him something? Was he angry because he just woke up on the wrong side of the bed that morning? No. Why was he angry? He was angry because you have taken my father's house and you've turned it into a marketplace. And that's not okay. Jesus' anger was righteous anger. Is it possible for us to have righteous anger? Absolutely. When you look at what's going on in the world that we have today, when you see children being taken to these drag shows and whatnot that should stir you up that should make you angry not not angry at the person but angry at the sin and angry at what is going on the slide that we're on because why because that anger leads to what the longer you the longer you hear those things you you tend to grow less angry and more sad as I look at those children in the, the pictures and the videos, I think, what chance do those kids have? It breaks my heart. It makes me angry that that happens in our society. Righteous anger is anger at sin, anger at, at what offends God. The anger that Jesus speaks of here in verse 22, he says, and he specifies that it is without cause, meaning that it is idle. It's without reason. It's without purpose. Men cannot uh, take man to court for his faults. <laughs> Aren't you glad? <laughs> all, all of us would probably be serving time right now. It, man can't take man to court for his faults. But God knows the hearts 
of man. And this idle, aimless hatred is the first step down the path that leads to murder. That's what Jesus is saying. Hey, he who hates his brother without cause, he's also guilty of judgment. But he goes on here in this verse. He says, whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Here's, here's the next point, as it were. Bitter contempt follows ungodly anger. Raka is a word that we do not use. It's an Aramaic word. It means empty-headed, worthless, a term of utter vilification. That's wonderful, that word. Yep. Yep. That's that's what it means. We don't we don't use it. We have other insults that carry the same meaning, but we don't use that one. Uh, so when Jesus says it, the idea of one who who doesn't have a whole lot of worth <laughs> would be the equivalent. So Bitter. Does, go ahead. Does that mean the same thing as calling someone a fool? Well, he's going to say that. That's the next line that he'll get. <laughs> yeah. But, I but get the head there. <laughs> oh, you're fine. You're fine. This right here is a contempt to call someone worthless is a level where you realize you, have you ever seen somebody or even you've had it yourself where you allowed yourself to look down on someone who was in a harder condition than you were in and you feel like I'm not, I wouldn't say this but I'm better than that that's dangerous that's dangerous according to this and and why would Jesus say this well because it's the tendency of man to look at other men uh, I've given you the example many, many times. You can always find somebody who will make you feel good about yourself, can't you? <laughs> if you look around, you can always find somebody. You know, at least I'm not, again, we always use Hitler. <laughs> at least I'm not Hitler. Really? That's your bar, huh? No. That, but this right here is when we have that contempt. We lower some, you know, they're, they're just worthless. Be careful. Matthew, 13, or Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Meaning, that's how I feel. That's why I'm saying this. That's why I'm letting this, in this day, this, this insult come out. He says that whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. This is kind of interesting how it goes hand in hand with what we've looked at Sunday. On Sunday, Jesus was taken before the council. In, in Israel, it was called the Sanhedrin. And Jesus says, the one who says this, that bitter contempt, they're worthy of the council. They're worthy of going before the Sanhedrin. This is the body that Jesus was brought before in Luke 22. Same idea. Jesus says, the one who says that is worthy of being brought before the council. And then we come to the last step on the path of murder. Revulsion. Look at the next part of the verse here, verse 22. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Revulsion is a short step away from the very act of murder, the actual act of murder. A fool, the word is moros. You hear a <laughs> word in there? <laughs> Moron. That's, that's what we get it from. It means dull, stupid. Or heedless. There's the, the technical definition. If you look in a Bible lexicon, it has the word stupid in it. <laughs> the word fool is used all throughout Scripture. Proverbs, especially. If you go to Proverbs, it's used many, many times. And a fool is defined by God. Matthew 5.22 is not prohibiting us from pointing out the behavior of those who manifest the character traits that God describes to be that of a fool. If somebody comes to me and they say, I don't believe there is a God, I can lovingly take the Bible and say, this, the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I'm not, I'm not breaking this verse, even in spirit. That's not what this is talking about. This verse is prohibiting moral judgment, indicating that one is not worthy of life. When you get to the point, that person, the idea here, to call one a fool, especially in this context, was this guy's wasting air. And what, what is it a short step from when you believe that somebody's wasting God's air? What's it just a short step to? Eternity. Stopping them from taking air. It's a short step from revulsion to murder. 
How did the Nazis get the average person to not care about the slaughter of millions? They, they degraded that population to the point when you can dehumanize a population, it's not difficult to get the public to permit or even participate in doing away with them. The, the Nazis, if you look at some of their propaganda, they said, these, these aren't people, they're Jews. They're, they're barely animals. And so people don't feel bad. I, I, I kill animals to eat. I kill animals that are nuisance. And so people thought, no, oh, they're, they're just Jews. Don't worry, don't worry about it. And so they, they off them in massive quantities, six million of them. Jesus says, whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Hell fire is interesting. It's, it's the word, the Greek word, Gehenna. Now, everybody in Jesus' audience knew exactly what that word meant. We don't use it as often. Gehenna was how the Jewish people referred to the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom, if you look at a map of Jerusalem, it's the bottom valley. Jerusalem's built on a hill. On the east, you have the Kidron Valley. On the south, you have the Valley of Hinnom. Hinnom was the dump. It was where they would take all of their garbage and they would push it out into the valley. And it was on fire all the time. And there was always stuff being added to it. So there was always smoke and fire coming out of the Valley of Hinnom. A Jewish person would not walk through the Valley of Hinnom if they could avoid it at any cost because everything that was unclean was tossed into the Valley of Hinnom. If you have a garment, if you read through and you read about a garment that has leprosy in it, you could throw it out into the Valley of Hinnom where it will be consumed in the fire. It's something, it's, it's out there. I'm not going to walk through the Valley of Hinnom for the same reason I'm not going to wade through the lagoon. That's, that's what Gehenna is. And Jesus says that he that says thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. The valley of Gehenna would be where the body of an executed criminal would often be tossed. They kill the, per the, the murderer, is taken to court, he's executed. What do we do with the body? Out into the valley of Hinnom where it will be consumed. So Jesus, God in the flesh, speaks of the law. To be guilty of murder before God, one must not commit the act, but begin the downward spiral in the mentality that ends in the act. Ungodly anger, anger at your brother without cause, leads to a bitter contempt that leads to a revulsion that ends in murder. It's a, it's a slippery slope. You know, if... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely a slippery slope. You know, if you ever listen to, uh, there have been uh, murderers who have given interviews prior to their execution, and many times they'll say, it started out so small. It started out, and they'll tell you how it started out, and, and it ended in this terrible, terrible place. It starts out in the mind. Murder starts here. Not I, I could take a gun or a knife and I could kill somebody, but it first starts here. And Jesus warns against not just the act, but against the spiral that leads to the act. So how do we keep from going this far? Because if we're all honest, we've all had hatred before. We've all had somebody where they've annoyed us to the point we say they're just... <clears throat> And, and we've had those thoughts that have come into our mind. So what do we do? How do we keep it from going this far? Well, he speaks in verse 23 that reconciliation comes before sacrifice. These seem like disconnected truths, but they're not. Take a look in verse 23. It says, therefore. What does therefore do? Well, it's a connecting word. <laughs> so don't. he's talking about murder, and then he says, therefore... If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember that thy brother hath aught against thee. We'll pause there just because the verse ends and, and explain just a little bit. Jesus is speaking to a Jewish audience. The gospel of Matthew is written predominantly to a Jewish audience. Just as Luke is written to a predominantly Gentile audience. Okay, That's not to say that we can't learn from Matthew and we can't learn from Luke. But... It is important to note who it's actually speaking to. Jesus is speaking to a Jewish crowd who's very familiar with the regular sacrifices that were made in Jerusalem. Everybody knows about this. 
All of the Jews had made their, their trip down to Jerusalem. Most of them made it annually. And Jesus gives a hypothetical situation. Remember, Jesus is very likely on the hills outside of Capernaum when he's saying this. Capernaum is in Judea. Or, I'm sorry, is in Galilee. Jerusalem is in Judea, on the other side of Samaria. To get to Jerusalem from Galilee, you have to go out around Samaria and cross the Jordan two times. It's a long trip. Jesus gives this hypothetical situation here in verse 23. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, if you find yourself in Jerusalem getting ready to offer your gift, and you remember that your brother, Barry mentioned this, the Greek word adelphos, it means countryman or kin. Or in the New Testament, it's often used to refer to a brother in Christ. Okay? You're there, you're about to offer your sacrifice, and you remember that your brother hath ought against thee. That's another word we don't use a whole lot. Ought is a grievance, an offense. I'm getting ready to offer my sacrifice, and I, I remember my brother, and we're not on speaking terms because of some issue. Maybe, maybe my fault, maybe his fault. Look at verse 24. Here's what to do. Leave. There thy gift before the altar. Go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. If I realize I'm not on speaking terms, or there's an unresolved issue with my brother, I'm to leave my sacrifice and first go and seek reconciliation. Again, as in the foregoing passage, God is more interested in the state of the heart than the action of my hand. The action of my hands is, I'm going to go through this sacrifice like everything's okay. God says, I know your heart. I know that you've got a brother who's got ought against you. This is a continuing theme throughout Scripture. 1 Samuel 15, 22. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice hearken than the fat of rams. <laughs> what did God really want out of King Saul? He wanted obedience. What did Saul offer instead? Sacrifice. God said, I would have rather had the obedience. Proverbs 21.3 To do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Meaning what? Meaning the condition of my heart matters more to God than the sound of my voice singing hymns on Sunday morning. Or the condition of my heart matters more to God than the check I drop in the plate. Or, or the tract I hand out. My heart matters. The heart matters. Again, what did, what did Jesus just equate with murder? The condition of the heart. And here he says, if you're in the act of worship, and you realize that there's a problem on the heart level. Stop. Go take care of the issue. This principle is found in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul explains to the church at Corinth the proper way to observe the Lord's table. If, if, we're, if we're here and we're getting ready to observe communion, we usually do it on a Sunday evening. We're having communion and, and there's bad blood between somebody sitting right here and somebody sitting right here. Should they take communion like everything's okay? And will that please God? No. What would please God? Well, what would please God is if this brother and this brother would, would, would walk to the back and say, Hey, look, I'm sorry. What happened is I was wrong. Can you forgive me? And then they walk back forward and they, then what? Well, then they take communion and it, it works. Why? Because the heart matters. Paul pointed out to the to the. Corinthian church that there were divisions among you in Ephesians or in, in 1 Corinthians 11 18. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. When there is unresolved sin between myself and a brother that would prohibit me from being able to worship God as he would have me to, I need to resolve the issue on the heart level. I must first do all that I can to be reconciled to my brother and then proceed in my act of worship. So let's, let's again, just because it's used, God uses it in 1 Corinthians, 
I'm sitting here ready to take communion and I realize I've got an issue with a brother. They're not even here tonight. What should I do? Well, according to this passage, I should, I should put the brakes on the physical act of worship till I can get my heart right. And I go and I be reconciled to my brother. A, a question that should, should deserve an answer. What if my brother won't allow reconciliation? Maybe there's, there's too much bad blood there. What, what do I do? Can, can I never, uh, can I never uh, observe communion? Can I never have the worship like I, like I should? Well, Romans 12, 18 says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If I've honestly, humbly confessed any wrongdoing and sought reconciliation with the brother, and he won't accept it, I've done what I can responsibility I fulfilled my duty and I may worship with a free and clear conscience it's it's not that if it's not that that brother has to forgive me it'd be great if they would but it's not on it's not on me at that point I've done what I can to seek reconciliation I have the verse down there at the bottom of your handout it's no wonder that Solomon said in Proverbs 4:23 keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life what matters most to Jesus, whether or not you're walking around with a gun killing people or whether or not you have a heart issue? Because I, I can honestly tell you, I've never, I've never killed anybody. But the heart, the heart's what we have to look out for. Most of us have been able to, to uh, abstain from allowing our temper to take us all the way to the point of murder. But the heart matters. Jesus speaks as the ultimate authority, greater than Moses and equal with God, when he declares the heart condition to be equal with the actions to which they lead. The act of murder begins in the heart. It starts in the mind. Ungodly anger leads to bitter contempt. Bitter contempt leads to revulsion, and revulsion often ends in the very act of murder. So the way to prevent this is constantly seeking reconciliation. When there's an offense and unity within the body of Christ. If, if I am not going to be bitter, it would be a whole lot easier for me to not get bitter if as soon as I realize there's a problem, I go to the brother and say, hey, look, I, I was wrong. Please forgive me. A whole lot easier if, if we keep short accounts rather than letting something go on and stretch out and dredge out over years. The heart matters. God says so. He equates the, the attitude of the heart with the action itself. Something that we should remember. Again, when you look at it this way, it doesn't make the bar easier to clear of being more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees, does it? It raises the bar. He said, everybody says, well, I can, I can step over the thou shalt not kill, but how about the thou shalt not hate? Well, that's, that's a little bit more difficult. Jesus is just making everything more intense to prove the fact you can't do this. But he did. And I've got his righteousness imputed to my account. Any thoughts that you have on what we've looked at here in Matthew 5, 21 to 24 here this evening? Something to, something to think about and something to be careful of. <laughs> because... The Bible tells us in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's why David says, search me, know my thoughts, try me and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need God to, it, it would be a good idea when you're sitting there in prayer, say, Lord, show me, show me the things that I'm missing. Show me the, show me the attitudes that are the start of something bad. I'll deal with them your way. 